following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools, funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. This program was made possible through generous support from the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation to George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Primarily, George is a co-production of the Fairfax Network and George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Hayward, Director of Programs at George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Welcome to the Phoebe Apperson Hearst Learning Center, located in the Donald W. Reynolds Education Center here at Mount Vernon. I can't think of a more appropriate venue to discuss using primary documents to bring George Washington and history to life for your students. George Washington played a significant role in every major event in American history between 1750 and 1799. Our mission here at Mount Vernon is to teach about his remarkable accomplishments, as well as to keep alive his legacy of character and civic responsibility, which remain relevant today. And that story can be found in the primary documents of the period. I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel of educators from our, three of our nation's top repositories of history. Jane Gordon, who's the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, Massachusetts. Leanne Potter, who's the Director of Education and Volunteer Programs at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and Sandra Trenholm, who's the Curator and Director of the Gilder Lehrman Collection at the New York Historical Society. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Today on Primarily George, each of our panelists is going to share documents from their collections at the 5th, 8th, and 11th grade levels. But before we get started on sharing ideas on using these plans in the classroom, I'd like to ask our panelists why should teachers be using primary documents in the classroom? Leanne? It was very difficult to get students excited about reading anything in their textbook. And the second I would hand my students a primary source, their interest in what we were learning about was heightened. And, I, and there are a zillion reasons for that. I think in part, documents help to personalize history, help students to connect with events and personalities in the past in ways that a text simply can't do. Primary sources often have interesting notes or markings on them that really appeal to students. The student is able to directly read something that was written by the creator with, with no, no interference from, from the middle person. And it also puts students in the role of investigators. They're able to compile the evidence, they're able to do the detective work with those primary source documents. And that's the excitement that historians find, and that's what we're trying to convey to the classroom. That's great. And Sandra? The textbooks teach us the who, what, when, where, but it's the why that's really important, and it's the why that we can learn from the documents. Why did we um, do the things we've done, and why do we become the country that we are? I'm delighted we're here today talking about using those documents to discover more about Washington and his world. And when we're studying someone like George Washington, it's important to remember that materials that help us understand who he was aren't all in one place, that you can go to multiple repositories to find information on who he was. And that's, that's absolutely why we want to teach with documents. We want kids to wonder, well, this is interesting, but who said so? And where did this come from? And I should know more about that organization. I'm interested in knowing what each of your respective institutions does to help not just teachers but students learn history through the documents in your collection. Massachusetts Historical Society actually was founded during George Washington's time back in 1791 and uh, through the last 200 plus years we've been trying to make those documents available for, for researchers the efforts now to bring those documents from, from our collections into the classrooms um, has been made possible through digitization so that the documents are ones that can be accessed in their digitized forms by teachers and students so that they are able to come as close as you possibly can to seeing the real thing. And we've been working a great deal to develop um, curriculum packages around our digitized documents. 
And Leanne, I know when people think documents, <laughs> they think the National Archives. So well, you know. under understandably, <laughs> 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 the National Archives. It's um, I have this mouthful that I can tell you about what the National Archives is. You want to hear it? Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> the National Archives is the federal agency responsible for preserving and making available the permanently valuable records of our federal government. The records that we hold really reflect the whole democratic experience of this country. Our oldest records date back to the, to the revolutionary period and before. The bulk of our materials begin with the early federal period and extend to about 30 years ago. Most agencies don't let go of their materials until they're at least that old. But the, the materials are, are really extraordinary. And because of the sheer quantity of them, getting them into the hands of classroom teachers is vital. So the Archives has had an education program for about 30 years, and we've done summer institutes for teachers since the late 1970s. We've partnered with organizations like the National Council for the Social Studies, writing Teaching with Documents articles, again, since the late 1970s. We work with publishers like Cobblestone, with organizations like National History Day, and I know you all do as well, tapping into existing networks and working with classroom teachers through other partners has been really important to us. We have an extraordinary website. There are hundreds of thousands of digital images online. We've got partnerships with organizations like Ancestry.com, with Footnote. Very deliberately getting materials into the hands of teachers is the reason we built our new learning center at the Archives Building in Washington and why our regional facilities and our presidential libraries have in recent years become much more enthusiastic and active in working with teachers and students. And obviously, you're never going to run out of ideas That's for lesson exactly plans right. with nine billion <laughs> documents right. behind That's you. Right. <laughs> but Sandra, I know the Gilder Lehrman Collection is also yep. just tremendous repository of American history. Gilder Lehrman is a little different. We began in 1991 when Richard Gilder and Louis Lehrman, um, two men who absolutely love American history, decided to start their own collection. They wanted to take documents that were in being sold into private collections and preserve them for p the public. And in 1994, they began the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History to service teachers and promote the study and love of American history. Um, since then, at this point, we have more than 60 Teaching American History grants. We run summer seminars where the teachers develop lesson plans that can be used in other schools. And I think that's really important for teachers who are in the classrooms and they know what's going on and what works and what doesn't to develop their own lesson plans that we then make available. We have documents available online, like the National Archives does. Um, we also have transcripts, and we found that teachers love using primary sources, but they're not the best at reading the handwriting, and it, it puts them off. So we have more than a thousand transcripts online that people can download at any time. Um, and of course, we obviously have a very great reference staff to deal with the questions that come from the teachers and help them find the t resources that can be used in the classrooms. They've also started in recent years putting together history in a box kits that have everything you need to do a lesson plan from posters to the classrooms, document booklets, resource kits, um, DVDs. They've actually gotten songs from the period so that it's more than just the documents. The, the songs are primary sources, the artwork. It makes it a whole experience for the students. The last point you made is terrific in mm -hmm. that history is not more than just documents. You know, It's really the art mm -hmm. and the music and the literature of the period, and yeah. I think all of your collections cover that. But also you mentioned the work that your teachers do mm -hmm. that is then made available mm -hmm. to other teachers. Yeah. And I know the National Archives does that, and as the Massachusetts Historical Society is you know, exactly. putting yeah. up materials created by teachers for teachers. Right. It's such a wealth yeah. um, uh, offshoot of the programs that you do. And we have teacher mm -hmm. institutes here as well, and they have two requirements when they finish the institute. And one is to do an in-service training for their colleagues, and the other is to create a lesson plan that we can share on our website. It helps teachers who don't have the opportunity to be here to learn through their colleagues. And so let's get to talking about that learning. Each of you have selected some terrific documents for today. Um, we're going to start with those documents that were selected for fifth grade students. And Jane, I'd like you, do you mind sharing yours first? Well, the document that I selected for fifth graders is actually a letter um, that was written by John Adams to his wife, Abigail Adams, on June 17th. 1775. Uh, it's part of about 1,200 letters that we have in our in our repository at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and of course the letters are wonderful because when John and Abigail were apart so much, it was their way of keeping together. John confided to Abigail, his dearest friend, um, all the things that were important to him, 
And in this particular letter, he's writing from the meetings of the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and he's describing George Washington, who's just been appointed commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. And it's a marvelous way to see how letter writing was used um, by these two, uh, by this couple. And it's also a wonderful way to see the choice of words that were used to describe the character of George Washington. We want them to look at that document and to ask why, again, why it was written, who it was written to, and what those words tell us about what John Adams sees in George Washington and what he values about George Washington's character. And I think it's interesting as well because students know George Washington, they know John Adams, they know their you know, contemporaries, but I don't think they often see them as sort of together, you know, talking about each other mm -hmm. in letters, so it really I think would establish a stronger connection between these two men. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's someone describing to his wife, who's never seen George Washington, what George Washington is like. That's great. But Leanne, what did you come up with? Most of the documents at the archives, because we hold the records of the federal government, they're government documents. Mm -hmm. And in the case of George Washington, most of those records aren't real great for 10-year-olds. Photographs, on the other hand, are. Um, and, and this really is a photograph, and it has something to do with George Washington, which is kind of funny because we all know that we have no photographs of George Washington because there were no cameras yet. But this particular photograph was taken in the 1860s. And what I love doing with students is simply giving them the photograph and not telling them anything about it. Let them try to figure out when they think the photograph was taken, um, what they think it is of, and if we're not studying George Washington, per se, you could look at this photograph and make all kinds of guesses about what it might be. In terms of document analysis, it's great for students to try to figure out what it is and do that detective work. But the other thing is it's an opportunity to talk with students about the notion of commemoration and how we remember George Washington and why would we want to build a monument to George Washington that is the highest point in the, in, you know, along the National Mall, why an obelisk, why, where did this come from, when was it completed, all of that. It's an opportunity for students to do additional research into the Washington Monument. But I think the photograph is kind of intriguing simply because it's not the finished monument. I love it when they get into documents and they start asking a question and the question leads to another question right. to another question that's and right. it goes back right. to what you said earlier about being the detectives, yes. right? history detectives, yeah. and that's what makes it fun. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned first thing on the textbooks, you know, yeah. the primary documents really draw you into a story mm -hmm. through questions and you know, you're so excited when you answer one and then there's something else you want to know about. Yeah. So. And it's exciting to see the kids pick up on that and to start a conversation and it just gets rolling yeah. and then you can step back and have exactly. no control and over just it, but it's it. a good thing. That's right. Well, they're helping each other out right. too. Very often if they're in a classroom situation and they've got multiple documents, those documents right. help uh, to fill in the gaps that, that particular documents may not do by themselves. So that they're actually acting as, um, I guess, advisors and, and supplying evidence to each other because That's you good. need all of those documents fitting mm -hmm. together to, to pull the story together. In the perspective they get almost excited as we do now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to, you know, Sandra, show us okay. which document you selected out of your collection okay. for fifth graders. Well, we selected um, Paul Revere's Boston Massacre print and what we've discovered of years working with teachers, everybody's seen this. Pretty much every American has seen a little teeny piece of it uh, printed as a sidebar in a textbook or used as an advertisement, but nobody's ever really looked at it. And when mm -hmm. you look at it, there's so much going on. Um, I once read that Paul Revere was one of the best propaganda artists of the American Revolution, mm -hmm. and this definitely mm -hmm. shows that from the way he drew the faces of the British soldiers versus the way he drew the faces of the American soldiers to the fact that there's a woman in the crowd with her hands clasped looking desperate. Um, even the dog that's in the front of the <laughs> picture, the students are always like, why is the dog there? <laughs> so what we do with this is we ask pointed questions that just open the discussion. What's your reaction to seeing this? What in this picture shapes your opinion of what happened? Um, we leave it up to the teachers to go over the Boston Massacre and you know the picture is not an accurate description of what happened, but why did Revere do that? What's he trying to do? And then we point out our, uh, our little secret thing here. If you go to the B in Butcher's Hall and look underneath of it, there's a tiny gun poking out the window shooting at someone. You can't see it when mm -hmm. the picture's two inches tall. You can only see it on the original. So we have the original up on our website for people mm -hmm. to download. We have some posters. But just to get them to read the document, it's a wonderful piece 
because it's not scary. Sometimes when you get that first manuscript and you have to read it and figure out what they're saying, you can struggle with the language. But for a first document, for someone to interpret, it's great. We're a visual society. We see images everywhere. Um, and then we've had teachers come back to us and say, well, we had such fun with this. We went to the newspapers and we went to magazines and we cut out pictures and cartoons to see what they were saying and how they're trying to shape our opinion mm -hmm. on current events. Right. So it's really an amazing it's perspective. perspective. Well, we selected uh, for fifth grade students an engraving by Amos Doolittle, and he actually did two versions of this. He did one in 1788 after the Constitutional Convention, and then again in 1791, um, right as Washington's ending his first term of president. And it's a wonderful image. It's an immediate graphic display that puts Washington in the center. He's surrounded by the seals of the states. And you know most children can, can grab onto what's being said <coughs> here. But we go back to the question of why. You know, why is it being said? Why is Washington depicted this way? Um, and we actually went on last year, developed a geography lesson based on this, where you know, bring it forward, um, have the students research our 50 states and create their own seal, mm -hmm. and then put them in a giant ring in the classroom and then determine who's going to be the centerpiece of the nation. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're voting for George Washington, mm -hmm. um, but uh, <laughs> you know, we hope that he still would maintain that. We want children to go back and look at these, compare the two images, because they are slightly different. What causes those differences in those years? Um, but celebrating um, Washington as a symbol of the country, right? The Constitutional mm -hmm. Convention, we're now states. And I think that's a statement that Doolittle's making. But let the kids do some analysis on that as well and, and really come to understand the power of Washington's image in the 18th century. Good afternoon. I'm Ted Crackle. I'm the editor-in-chief of the papers of George Washington. Welcome to our office in Charlottesville, Virginia at the University of Virginia. Let me tell you just a little bit about the papers of George Washington. The project was launched here at the University of Virginia in 1968, and we have in the years since uh, published some 60 volumes uh, of uh, Washington's papers, and we'll ultimately publish 90. There are in our records uh, here copies of about 135,000 documents, and we work from those uh, annotating them, transcribing them, and ultimately publishing them. In addition to these, we also have a digital edition, which has started recently and something I think you might be very interested in. Let me show you how you can access uh, our digital edition uh, on the uh, web page of the Washington Papers. Uh, at the bottom is a white uh, block that says the Papers of George Washington Digital Edition. Let's click on that. It takes us to a page that describes both the Mount Vernon edition uh, and a second edition. Let's create, click on Mount Vernon and that'll bring us to the Mount Vernon website in the Learn page. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom of that page, you'll find a Papers of George Washington digital edition underlined. Double click on that. And you've opened then the Papers of George Washington, the Mount Vernon guest version. I'm really curious now to see what's up at the eighth grade level. Um, Jane, do you want to start again? Sure. Well, what I've selected for eighth grade um, from the collections of Massachusetts Historical Society is actually a letter that George Washington writes to his good friend and the Secretary of War, Benjamin Lincoln. And this is about eight months after the British surrender at Yorktown, so it's in June of 1782. George Washington is faced by a terrible dilemma. He's actually seeking his old friend's advice about whether to execute a young British prisoner in retaliation for the hanging of an American militia man by, by, by loyalists in New Jersey. Um, and this is a dilemma that uh, has no easy choice or easy answer. And this dilemma could turn into an international crisis. Without revealing any more about it, I think it's perfect for, for middle school students because they, they, they have that great interest in people who are in situations where they have difficulty making a decision, mm -hmm. where there is no easy answer. And what better way of really being able to make George Washington approachable than to show him in the situation where he simply doesn't know what to do. He has lots of alternatives. Every one of them has good and bad implications. He could have made a different decision than the one he made without, again, giving it away. And so he is, is 
is shown as the person who's, who's somewhat vulnerable, who, who is indecisive at this point and needs to turn to others. If, I think if we always present our, our you know, forefathers and national leaders as people who always knew exactly what they were doing at any minute, that would send a message to, to young people that they're the only ones who aren't sure what to right. do in a given situation. So I love this aspect of George Washington and that's why this particular document I think is so so interesting for them. Right. And, and, and there's the drama. I mean, yeah. which and oh, besides, absolutely. it's such a good point about being faced with questions yeah. and difficult time making decisions. I Who agree. doesn't want you know a good mystery or drama? Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's a great yeah. choice. Leanne, what did you come yeah, up with? Yeah, see, choices are hard. This was, it was hard to make this choice, but the letter that I did select is a letter from the Revolutionary Period. It's from March of 1781, and it's General George Washington writing a letter back to Congress. And he is congratulating Congress on, and I'm going to read it word for word, he says, Give me leave sincerely to congratulate Your Excellency and Congress upon the completion of the Confederation of the United States, an event long wished for, which I hope will have the happiest effects upon the politics of this country, and which will be of essential service to our cause in Europe. What he's doing is he's congratulating Congress on the passage of the Articles of Confederation. And the reason I love this document is because it's one of those, at this moment in time, he has absolutely no idea what's ahead for him. He doesn't know that a few years down the road there's going to be a constitutional convention that he is going to be the president of. He doesn't know that the result of that convention is going to be our Constitution. And he has no earthly idea that he's going to become the first president of this country under mm -hmm. the new Constitution. At this moment in time, he's a general and he's in New Windsor, Connecticut, and he's writing a letter because he's heard that Congress has passed the Articles of Confederation, and he's writing a note to congratulate them. And I just, I love the, you know, I think so often, especially with young people when we study history, it's, we think we know it all. We know the outcome. We know what happened. And when we look at a letter like this, it's an opportunity for us to think about, at this moment in time, he didn't know what was coming for him. And that's exactly kind of getting at what you were saying about eighth graders, you know, what, what is appealing is they don't really know what's ahead for them. Right. And the possibilities are extraordinary, and in this case, more than extraordinary. But he, at the moment he had no idea. That's why I chose that letter. And Sandra, what did you select for our eighth grade audience? I love my document because okay. it matches so well with yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's George Washington writing to Henry Knox in mm -hmm. April of 1789. If you want to know the real George Washington, look at the Henry Knox collection. and know you also have a lot of Henry Knox documents. He is so unguarded when he talks to Knox, and so you get a real glimpse of who he is. At this point, Washington is getting ready to take the oath of office, and at that point, um, the new president was sworn in in April, not in January as we mm -hmm. have it now. And he says that the, uh, the inauguration is delayed, and he's very happy about the inauguration being delayed. And I'm going to read from this as you did. Um, because my movements to the chair of government will be accompanied with the feelings not unlike those of a culprit who's going to his place of execution. So unwilling am I, in the evening of a life nearly consumed in public cares, to quit a peaceful abode for an ocean of difficulties. Okay. Washington didn't know what was coming for him. Yeah. He kind of has an idea of how difficult oh, it's going to be in the, the coming years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so you get that idea of, oh my God, I really don't want to be president. This is going to be hard. Um, he might be the only president who really understood how hard it was going to be mm -hmm. um, to assume because the presidency. He has no one. He has no one. Right. Yeah. He's going to set the precedent. Yeah. Yeah. And this right. letter we use it again here at Mount Vernon, but you can use it in a classroom right. when you're standing in a large yeah. dining room where, you know, um, legend at Mount Vernon tells us this is where he learns he's going to be the first president. What's going through his head? But, you know, you read that letter, and I use that with fifth, sixth, yeah. seventh days. You know, is he saying yippee? You know, yeah. is he, or is he a little bit mm -hmm. afraid yeah. about what he's facing? I sort of afraid of a little failure, which we're all right. afraid of uh -huh. failure. Great for eighth grade just on that alone. I decided to use his 1799 census of slaves at Mount Vernon. And what's really remarkable mm -hmm. about the document is there's, as you all know, very little first-hand documentation from the actual enslaved community. And although it's not the purpose of his census, um, he's <coughs> such a meticulous record keeper that if you look at this document, you discover the names of the people that worked and lived at Mount Vernon, their ages, their family relationships, where they lived, 
And so you begin to put a face on what has largely throughout history been a faceless community. Mm -hmm. And you begin to see personalities developed simply by who they're married, how old they are, what their job is. Um, and it's, it's, it's a wealth, I mean, it's a really rich resource for students to look at. Um, you can examine the fact that George Washington was a slave owner, which, you know, is not a palatable fact for many people. Um, for our, our purposes in discussing that, at least we can say that he created this in anticipation of emancipating his slaves and his wealth. Um, but it doesn't negate the fact that he was a slave owner. And then you take it on to what were their jobs? What were their skill levels? You know, Virginia law prohibited marriage, but Washington recognized marriage between his slaves. Why? I mean, that's a good question for eighth graders and, and above to. Why would he recognize those marriages? Um, you know, we've, we use a document in sort of activities where you can plan it with, a, you know, he also, Washington is meticulous, and every overseer is required to submit a weekly report to George Washington. Mm -hmm. So look at the slave census, you know, and create your own weekly report to George Washington, incorporating the people that mm -hmm. lived here. For younger children, research the jobs. You know, what is a Cooper? What does a Cooper mm -hmm. do at Mount Vernon? Mm -hmm. you know? And frankly, we say blacksmith, we throw it around, but. Uh, I'd be pretty sure that about 80% of us don't know exactly mm -hmm. what a blacksmith's role on the plantation mm -hmm. was. Um, and getting to the sense that, you know, this community basically built Mount Vernon and maintained it through mm -hmm. the entire time that Washington was here. Um, and it's a document that's important for looking at Washington as a slave owner. It's a document that's remarkable for, you know, pulling out information about the community. Over 90% of the Mount Vernon community was enslaved. So. It's that's the one that we chose, and um, it's it's remarkable that we have that much information about one man. But what I really like about the document that you selected is, especially when students are here, reminding them that George Washington and his wife were not the only people here, mm -hmm. right. and like you said, that the reason this estate was even maintained. I mean, he wasn't here a whole lot. He was kind of busy, <laughs> off, you know, with the revolution. He was with. The Congress. He was with. He was in New York, serving as president. And so, in order for this estate to function, that was the community that was vital. And I think it, it's it's wonderful that those records exist and it, have been it, maintained. It's just a great document, and, and because it is more thorough than most records right. of that period. There yeah. are others that you'll find from large plantations, but this one is, right. is particularly detailed. Yeah. So, well, and it and represents Mount Vernon, but a, a strong look at slavery of the 18th century yeah. as well. And I think you can look at documents that exist from Washington to learn about slavery and what mm -hmm. slave life was like. And we've had that with women's history as well. There's not a lot of women's history from that time period, but you can get it from someone else's letters. Mm -hmm. And you just have to dig a little yeah, more and yeah. ask more questions. But it's, it's there. You just have to look hard for it. And so if you take this document, you take a look at our archaeology that we've done mm -hmm. over the past, you know, almost 60 years, um, then the community starts yeah. to come to life. But um, and we have to move on. Yeah. Good we, choice. We're having so much fun. <laughs> You've just looked at the 1799 slave census created by Washington that summer, but if any of your students were having trouble looking at that, you could find it here, and I think if we just type in slave as a search term, uh, we've already set up the summer of 1799, and search, and here it is, Washington slave list, June 1779. And here's a transcription then of the document uh, that would be a bit easier to read for those that were having difficulty. As you can see, it's a long document with lots of names. One of the names you wouldn't see on this list is that of Hercules, uh, the president's cook. Hercules ran off from the household just before the family left uh, Philadelphia to head back to Mount Vernon at the end of the presidency. A few months later, Washington was still looking for another cook, and he was having a second problem uh, in trying to locate one. Let me read a letter that he wrote to George Lewis in November of 1797. The running off of my cook has been a most inconvenient thing to this family, and what renders it more disagreeable is that I had resolved never to become the master of another slave by purchase. But this resolution, I fear, I must break. I have endeavored to hire, black or white, but I am not yet supplied. 
We've gone over some absolutely wonderful documents at the, for students at the fifth grade level and the eighth grade level. And so let's turn our attention to older students at 11th grade level, which sometimes makes it a little bit more open for us to choose documents that allow the students to use their analytical skills, sometimes for 18th century documents in particular, which can be heavy to wade through. Um, the students of this age group have a challenge, and yet it's a very exciting challenge and to investigate these documents. So Jane, why don't you tell us what you selected? For the 11th grade, um, I've chosen a document from, again, from the collections of Massachusetts Historical Society, which shows George Washington in another dis difficult situation. This time, it's not so much of a dilemma, it's really more taking command. It's right when he has become the commander in chief of the Continental Army. It's July 4th. 1775. He's in Cambridge. Um, he needs to bring some kind of order and integration to this group of about 20,000 men um, who are surrounding the British forces in Boston. It's right after the Battle of Bunker Hill. There are many, many, many different groups of militiamen who have all assembled. They all have different orders that they follow. They all have different ways of re relating the officers to their men. They all have different rules. And George Washington has to make of this motley group one whole, one unified whole. And so he, he issues orders. And what we have in our collections is the book, the orderly book that Artemis Ward, uh, his major general, um, has and he in which Artemis Ward has very carefully written down what all of these orders are. So for high school students, it's an opportunity to do that kind of investigation, to use those kind of analytical skills, because they need to be able to decipher from all of the orders that George Washington gives out what the condition is of the army, what the challenges are that George Washington is facing, what the you know decisions are that he's going to have to make, what he has to overcome in order to make of this one army. And that's where we're asking them to take one body of evidence and from that make some very interesting deductions about what's, what's happening. And all goes back again to that question of why. Why are these orders being issued? Why are these orders being exactly. created? You know, and exactly. which leads into the condition of the army at that time. You've got it, exactly the circumstance. And this is actually part of a large website um, called The Coming of the American Revolution that was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And it's really meant to make detectives, make historical detectives of, of high school students. So we're giving them that evidence and we want them to bring it together. I want to go do it. Sounds okay. like fun. Well, it makes me think <laughs> about how um, this is a nice lead in to the document that I chose in a way that I hadn't planned. But um, chances are good the National Archives holds those same orders, only the government's copies because we hold you know, exactly. the records of the federal. Exactly. So it's fun to think about where else might materials exist. Yes. And so this one, the one that I chose, is George Washington's first inaugural address. And as you might suspect, there were multiple copies of this, but the one that, that I'm that, that we're featuring from the archives is the one that's actually in the holdings of Congress. And the reason I chose it is kind of along the lines of what you were saying about allowing students at this level to use more of their analytical skills, but there's also a need for students to understand effective communication 200 and some odd years ago versus today. Because so much of what is in this particular speech is hard. Some of these words we don't use today. Some of the, um, you know, very often you give a document like this to a group of students and the first thing that they actually want to do to it is edit it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> add some punctuation, <laughs> add some commas, make a couple more periods, do something to it to make it easier to read because it's tough. And the message in it, though, is appropriate for a child at any level. When he, this is, this is, Again, it's his first inaugural address, so he's addressing, and he's addressing Congress, which is interesting if you compare George Washington's first inaugural address to more modern day inaugural addresses. Today's speeches are written for the masses. This speech was written for Congress. You know, it's a, the tone, it, it's, oh, it's, because he knew yeah. that he, yeah, yeah, certainly. Oh, certainly, yeah. certainly. So the but when he refers to, yes. like, you, mm -hmm. he's, he's speaking he specifically to Congress. To Congress. Um, but, but what he says is you get a real interesting look at part of his character, and this is similar to the letter that you mentioned about how, and that was to Knox, right, where he's writing about his, he really kind of wants to stay at home. 
Well, you get that in, in the speech as well, that, that when he heard the call of his country, he, he, he couldn't but hear love for his country. But at the same time, there's a, another feeling that he has for wanting to stay at Mount Vernon, and so he's kind of torn between duty and it's duty to his country and responsibility, and it's his own personal wishes. So I, I just, I like that, it, part of it is that kind of conflictedness that yes. you were getting at but earlier. But at the same time. Part. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and part of it is just, if it's there's effective communication in this, there's an evolution of the English language in this. Uh, there's an awful lot that, that you can really use with students comparing today's inaugural addresses with those from the past, there's, there's just a lot of opportunity. And very often, if you select a document to work with students, you know, the realities of the classroom are you don't have a lot of time. You know, you've got 180 days to teach everything from, you know, exploration through the Civil War or, or more, and how much time you're actually going to have to spend on a single character in American history is pretty minimal. And being able to recognize that through all of these documents, we can teach a lot of additional content, maybe through the lens of a single person that we're familiar with, makes these kinds of selections effective. Sandra, what did you choose? Okay, I choose. I chose. <laughs> sorry, I chose a document from George Washington to Jonathan Trumbull, and it's written in July of 1799. And apparently, the Federalists figured out that Adams probably wasn't going to be reelected, so they approached George Washington to run again to become president. And it's really interesting because Washington does not answer the call this time. Instead, he goes into the reasons why he won't be president. And um, I know you've used this document before. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And personally, it, one of my pet peeves is people think that elections and presidents and politics were pristine in the past and we're the only people who have corrupted them. <laughs> but this document shows that it's been bad you know, since 1799. <laughs> <Yeah, basically. laughs> He says how party politics have made it so that no matter what the character of the candidate is, all that matters is what the party is doing, mm -hmm. and that he, as a person, mm -hmm. will have no influence over voters because all they care about is what the Republicans say and the Federalists say. And he brought up a point, and it's a great line, <coughs> Let the um, party hold up a broomstick and call it a patriot and a son of liberty, and he'll command <laughs> votes in toto. It doesn't matter who the candidate is, it's the party that people are voting for. And I have um, an interesting quote here that anybody who loves George Washington would be devastated by. Um, he's, worried I know, I know. <laughs> he's worried that if he runs, he's going to be charged with concealed ambition, which wants only an occasion to blaze out, and in short, dotage and imbecility. So if you can imagine calling Washington a doting old imbecile, I mean, we just wouldn't do it. But he's worried that the vicious that party politics will attack his character, and he won't have any of it. And it had been attacked yeah. a lot. Yeah. He was, yes. you know, that's the one thing when we work in a primary document book years ago. So we sent somebody to look for documents mm -hmm. that sort of proved that Washington was not considered saintly by everybody, and he was oh. vilified in the press in, in many instances during. Right. Um, both terms of his presidency, and he, and, he, and he didn't care for that. But I think that letter that you've selected really ch highlights um, his opinion of party politics and divisive parties. Uh -huh. And it's interesting because, you know, the election of 1800 mm -hmm. is probably one of the most contested and, and right. nasty elections right. in yeah. our history. And it's interesting because um, I commute to work, I take the subway a lot, and you hear a lot of conversations that we've never had a uh, contested election before, that we never had a father-son president before, that we've never done <laughs> all these things that have come out in the last few elections, and they're all there from yeah. the very beginning. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to tell that to kids, have them figure it out, and go home and yeah. tell their parents. <laughs> we'll spread the word out. <laughs> spread the word out, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I selected a document that it's considered by most historians to be, if not the most important, one of the most important pieces of writing that Washington ever did. And towards the end of the war, the Battle of Yorktown's been completed, Washington's at Newburgh with the Continental Army, and he sits down and writes a letter to the 13 governors. And over time, it's, known, it's come to be called the Four Pillars of Republican Government. And it's an extremely long document. But in this document, Washington outlines the four things that are essential to be done if our nation's going to survive. And you all quoted a little while ago, and I'm just going to give you a sentence out of this from George Washington. 
These are four things which I humbly conceive are essential to the well-being, I may even venture to say, to the existence of the United States as an independent power. And the war's over, but he's not going to stop thinking about this, okay? That's the first step. Now we mm -hmm. have to turn our attention to how we make this work. And he has tremendous vision. Um, and, and it's such an important document. And I, we use it a lot with high school students. I use it a lot with teachers. Um, and we don't own this document. The one that we share, Gilder Lamond Collection gave yep. us a generous permission to use. It was published widely in a broadside called The Last Legacy of Its Excellency General Washington. So it went beyond, as we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, sort of the private correspondence to the 13 governors. But he also made sure that it was published so that the masses mm -hmm. could see this and I see, in his opinion, what needed to be done. And it's one of the first documents that Washington terms the phrase national character. Mm -hmm. And if you look mm -hmm. through, he, when, he, when he finds a phrase he likes, you can read for like two months and you'll find that phrase again and again. Again. <laughs> over and over and over again. But national character becomes a resounding theme from the end of the war through his presidency. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we like to ask students is what does he mean by mm -hmm. that? What, what does national character mean? It's, um, it's written in a very heavy 18th century style. It's a very formal document. So one of the things that we suggest is that students read it and then rewrite it in mm -hmm. modern terms. So, you mm -hmm. know, define it, write it. What is he saying? But write it the way what that they would say it now. Um, so they really are, you know, going beyond history. You're going into an analysis. You're also going into English. You know, yeah. it's a very cross-curricular yeah. document. That's one of the things that right. we haven't touched on. But each one of these documents is strongly could be used across the disciplines in the classroom, in the school. Um, the interesting thing about this document is it's extremely long. The original is very, very long. So when I use this, I choose the actual outline of the four things here he thinks is essential. And so I'm excerpting, I'm editing. Right there, when I'm giving this to you or to the students, they're seeing my editorial viewpoint. So mm -hmm. I'm curious how you all work with that when you're, you're that middle man. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm the middle man. I think you brought up some really interesting issues, and 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 part of what I always deal with is is when you take an excerpt from a document, you're you're focusing on what the point that you want to make, or any editor mm -hmm. focuses on what he the point he wants to make, and, and that. But in the case, for example, of the Adams letters, you've got you know something that has to do with what we might consider an issue or event of national importance. Surrounding that in the letter are all sorts of comments that John might make to Abigail or vice versa about the family, about the farm, about smallpox inoculation, about all those little things that put people into the context of, of daily life mm -hmm. because people's lives are comprised of so many different elements and at the same time you're thinking about inventing a country you're also worrying about what's going on at home and are the crops going to be in on time but that's part of, of life so how you make sure that people get that context is that it's really an interesting dilemma it's, it a, it's a real balance it is we, we advocate at the archives we really advocate for not excerpting for not transcribing for letting the students and teachers work with the real thing or with a facsimile of the real thing. What we always, you know, try to think about is how to give enough background right. and, and give the students tools to be able to make sense of the document, yeah. but not to give it yeah. away. And but to have the transcription later on for, yeah. you know, And, for and when you enter backup. teachers, yeah. too, teachers yeah. kind of need the transcription yeah. so that they can help prepare the lesson and tell the students when they have something right or wrong. At least that's one of the things that yeah. we've found very or, helpful. Or in, but encouraging them to let that be part of what their students can do. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion, but it's time to put our documents back into the repositories and say thank you to our panel. Jen Gordon from the Massachusetts Historical Society, Leanne Potter from the National Archives, Sandra Trenholm from Gilder Lehrman Collection. Thank you all for being here today. I want to thank also Ted Crackle at the University of Virginia for his digital contributions to today's program. For more information on the resources and archival materials you've heard about in today's program, please visit our website, www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. And I'd like to invite all the teachers who are watching the program today to visit the Phoebe Apperson Hurst Learning Center here at Mount Vernon, where you can access lesson plans and other curriculum material and browse our collection of books on George Washington and the founding era. I'm Nancy Hayward. Thanks for watching Primarily George. <laughs>